Okay, this lesson is about uh, the excretory system. Questions specifically. Uh, so questions, uh, example questions that you might get in the in the tests or exams, and we're going to go through that. Okay, we're going to start off here just with a simple diagram of the nephron, which is a functional unit of the kidney. Here we have the Bowen's capsule. Inside the Bowen's capsule, we have the glomerulus, which got, has got a lot of capillaries. We've got an afferent and efferent arteriole, which they seem to have swapped around here a bit. Uh, the afferent arteriole going into the Bowen's capsule is normally wider. The efferent arteriole going out of the Bowen's capsule is normally narrower. This causes a lot of pressure inside the glomerulus, and that pushes out a lot of the liquid that's inside the blood into the Bowman's capsule to be filtered. Most of the blood goes into the Bowman's capsule, and then what happens is this fluid, this filtrate, moves down the proximal tubule. In turn, this blood vessel, the efferent arterioles, come together and they circulate themselves around and also around here and all the way up to the distal tubule before they eventually then go out of the kidney. What we then see is that certain substances get reabsorbed by the blood. Specifically, if we take a look at some of these glucose, all of the glucose is supposed to be reabsorbed back into the, the blood. Amino acids that are needed goes back into the blood. Sodium that is needed, so it regulates the amount of sodium. Some sodium will eventually reach the section over here, which goes to the pelvis of the kidney and eventually will go into the urea tract and go to the bladder. But some sodium is reabsorbed actively. So there's active absorption or so, um, active transport happening there. And then water will follow passively. Uh, by ways of diffusion or more accurately called, ladies and gentlemen, more accurately called osmosis. Going from a high concentration of water inside the proximal tubule to a low water concentration inside the blood. More water, more sodium, more water, so, uh, uh, more sodium, water follows. And then finally, water follows at the very end here. Last attempt to get water back into the, the blood vessels. Especially this last part is going to be very important because over here, ADH is going to have an effect. So what is ADH? It's anti-diuretic hormone. It prevents you from dehydrating. That's where the diuretic comes from. And what the antidiuretic hormone does is over in this area, there's holes. And it opens up these holes that are here and makes them wide so that more water will leave and go back into the blood vessels. So it prevents dehydration. And this especially happens when you haven't taken in enough water. And we need to try and conserve water in the body. Which means that the urine, which eventually goes down here, is going to have, is going to be very concentrated. It's going to have a very high concentration inside. Um, um, and so it's going to be very concentrated with very little water. Okay. 
Now, this is the functioning of ADH, and it's going to be not only important for this year, but also important for next year when you are doing the endocrine system in grade 12, and you have to know this process. So let's take a look at two scenarios here. Firstly, water content in the blood is normal. Let's change it now into one of the two scenarios. So um, I eat a lot of salt, and or I'm sweating a lot. I went for a run, and I'm sweating a lot. Then the water content of the blood is going to decrease. The water content of the blood is going to decrease. Just a moment. Um, okay, just give me a moment, guys. My son is just needing some help very quickly. Um, okay, what was this? I need to lose. Next up, we are over here. Okay, you're not going to make a dirty house. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Let's go on. Now, when the water content in the blood is low, it says to the brain, or more specifically, the pituitary gland, we also use another word here. We say the hypophysis, not hypothesis, hypophysis. And, but be careful, don't confuse it with hypothesis and don't confuse this with the hypothalamus which is another part of the brain. The hypothesis then secretes a lot of ADH, antidiuretic hormone, and then there's a high volume of water that's then reabsorbed in the kidney that goes back into the blood. Okay, and there's a small volume of concentrated urine. So your urine is gonna be very dark and it's gonna have a very urine-like smell. Um, more than uh, more than normal, and then goes to the bladder, and then a high volume of water passes back into the blood and returns the water content to normal. The other side of it is that if I drink too much water, then the water content is going to be very high, and it gets picked up by the pituitary gland and it secretes less ADH or little ADH because we have enough water. A low amount of water is reabsorbed into where? Into the blood. And then a high volume of dilute urine is then passed. Your urine is going to be very light, almost like water uh, or just water. Very little other things inside that urine. And then the volume of the water that passes, a low volume of water passes back into the blood, which brings us back to the, the norm, the, what we need. Okay. Now, first question here. Let's take a look. Now, this is specifically based on that, that very same scenario we talked about now with the ADH. Study the table below and show the volume of urine produced by six different people on a hot day and a cold day and answer the questions that follow. So on a hot day, we're going to sweat a lot. If we are sweating, we already lose a lot of water. So we're going to have a low concentration of water. On a cold day, we're not going to sweat a lot. And what will happen is we're going to have a high concentration of water in the, in the blood. Then, so let's take a look just on average. 430, 890, 350, 1060. This is the amount of urine produced. 270, You can see all these values are lower on this side than on this side. There's very high values. In total on a cold day, there's a hundred cubic centimeters, uh, sorry, a thousand cubic centimeters of urine produced. 
Then it asks you, work out the mean volume of the urine. So what are you going to do? You're going to add these together. You're going to add this together. And there's six readings, and you're going to divide the total by six to get the mean value. And your answer will get another mark. So you'll get a mark for adding up. You'll get a mark for dividing by six. And you'll get another mark for giving me the total. I'm not going to work it out right now. And remember to add the unit. The unit is important because if we don't give the unit, it's going to be wrong. It needs to be cubic centimeters. Then, what can you deduce from the difference between the, the mean volume of urine produced on a hot day and the mean volume of urine produced on a cold day? So, on a hot day, we produce less urine. We produce less urine. Explain why on a hot day less water is lost from the body as urine because a lot of that water is lost from sweat. Sweat is a lower concentration of what? Of water in the blood. I want to conserve the water in my body. So less water is going to go to the bladder. And more water will be reabsorbed because what is secreted? ADH, that antidiuretic hormone, which is going to make the nephron absorb more water back into the blood vessels. Next question. Okay, last question, this one. Let me just zoom out a slight bit here. There we go. Okay. It's not that, uh, it's fine. Let's go through it like this. An extract on a renal failure and is uh, an extract on renal failure and its treatment is given below. The diagram below represents a dialysis machine. We put people on a dialysis machine if the kidneys aren't working well to try and do the job of the kidneys. And it's used to, uh, to treat patients with renal failure. So let's take a look at how it does from patients' blood vessels. So, it, but they insert this, um, this is normally through a port, which they insert into a, one of the main veins of the, um, the person. Then the blood is pumped out, and then it goes through here, and it's filtered. As it's filtered, and then it get, puts it back the blood back into the person's body. Now they have to do this every two to three days, normally. And normally, when they sit, it takes quite a while. Um, anything from an hour to three hours that they they sit uh, for this dialysis to take place. Dialysis fluid is coming in here and then going out. And so what do I need to do? I need to notice about what is the concentrations of everything inside my dialysis fluid? And what is the concentrations of everything inside the blood? And according to that, remember, all things wants to go through the fusion or in the case of water through um, no, I cannot remember the word. Can you believe that? Not myosis, please, not myosis. Okay. The fusion or osmosis. <laughs> Can you believe that I forgot that? Osmosis. Okay. Um, osmosis goes through a semi-permeable membrane. Now, there's a membrane in here, we, uh, dialysis membrane. Semi-permeable membrane where water moves from a high concentration to a low concentration. If it's osmosis, what is moving? It's water. And how is it moving? Through a semi-permeable membrane. So, sorry, um, I accidentally cut off the last sentence, but let's try to go through this. Kidneys can become so damaged that they no longer function properly, and we say that the person has renal failure. People with severe renal failure can be treated uh, by dialysis using dialysis machine to purify the blood. Dialysis is the separation of molecules by size. All the molecules suffusing through the dialysis molecule. Uh, the process takes uh, between three to six hours, I say, and needs to be done two or three times a week. Okay. Describe what renal failure is. So it is when the kidneys or the nephrons don't work properly and they're not filtering the blood properly. Okay. 
which process is illustrated by a diagram above and ladies and gentlemen it's dialysis at which point of the diagram would you expect the highest concentration of urea urea okay so let's discuss urea Urea is a byproduct of protein breakdown when I get my amino acids. And according to the memo, it's at B. Let's take a look at where B is. So lots of urea there, but it filters out as we move through the dialysis machine. It filters out into the dialysis fluid. And then we sure, say there's not much left. So the purification of blood takes place in the dialysis. Two main processes. Okay, so waste products moves from the dialysis tubing for the blood, where there's a high concentration of waste. So high concentration of waste it wants to move to a low concentration into the dialysis fluid, where there's a low concentration of waste. With, um, and then through the process of diffusion, always move from a high concentration to a low concentration. And the concentration gradient is maintained because the dialysis fluid is constantly being pumped through the system. So it's constantly being pumped in and out, and in and out. Keep the concentration of waste low. Then, Explain why dialysis machine needs to be selectively permeable, people, because it allows selective movement of waste products, all the smaller pieces, into the dialysis fluid. We don't want to let everything leave into the dialysis fluid because I'm going to need things like glucose, which is a larger molecule. I want that to, to stay in the blood. Then, 3.2.6. Right. Renal failure affects the osmoregulatory function of the kidney so that it no longer excretes water efficiently. Explain the effect of renal failure on a person's blood pressure. More water in your blood is going to have a higher blood pressure. Higher blood pressure. Why? Because, look over there. If this is um, your a vein and I've got more water, I'm going to have more water flowing through here and more pressure on the blood vessels. Think of a balloon, for example. If I put more water, pour more water into a balloon, and remember your blood vessels is a closed system, then as there's more water in the balloon, there's more pressure going to be on the outside of the balloon. Okay. Let's go to the next question, 2.3. Study the representation of the Malpighian corpuscle of... Okay, apologies. Uh, let me just double check if everything's okay. Yeah. Um, yes. Okay. Okay. So we have the Bowman's capsule and we have the glomerulus, and together the glomerulus and the, the glomerulus and the Bowman's capsule is called the Malpighian body or Malpighian corpuscle. Then. Identify uh, the representative part of the nephron shown. Okay, identify the representative part of the nephron shown, and they gave it to you in the Malpighian body, or uh, we, we can say the Bowman's capsule, or we can say the glomerulus, but together they form the Malpighian body. And yes, they also gave Malpighian body as a complete. Okay. Name the parts labeled A and B. Afferent, arteriole, and efferent, arteriole. Okay. 
um, etheric, it is ring of trio. A trio just means small or three. Okay, people, you can unmute and you can ask your question. So is there any difference between um, the Malfigian poly and the Bowman's capsule? Shepo, you had your hand raised. Do you have a question for us? Yes, I was saying, is there any difference between the Malfigian poly and oh, the Bowman's capsule? Uh, I'm sorry, Shepo, I didn't hear you because my volume was off. Would you repeat your question, please? Um, is there any difference between the Malfigian body and the Bowman's capsule? Yes, uh, the Malfigian body is the complete structure, including the gall glomerulus. The Bowman's capsule is only this part. Uh, let me make a uh, highlight it. It's this part. That's the Bowman's capsule. Uh, and so that does not include the, the uh, when I say Bowman's capsule, it actually does not include this glomerulus. The two together make up what we call the Malfigian body. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Then explain why the above diagram does not accurately represent one of the structural adaptations for the process that's taking place in it. Okay. So, um, if we take a look at it, I want to uh, remember I told you in the previous diagram already, A and B are going to be different sizes. If we take a look at A, A needs to be bigger and B needs to be smaller. And the reason for this is that um, we want to cause pressure in the Bowman's capsule to, uh, in the glomerulus to actually push the filtrate into the Bowman's capsule. And I create that pressure by making A big and making B small. Then that creates pressure inside my glomerulus. Okay. So if there's no blood pressure inside the glomerulus, then the filtration wouldn't take place as it should and there will be no ultrafiltration happening. Okay. Next question. Study the table that shows the flow rate and concentration of certain substances taken at regions A, B, C, and D of the nephron in the human kidney. Okay, so let's take a look at what happens. Flow rate, this is very slow, four cubic centimeters per minute. This is also very slow, that is higher, and that is very fast. That's a, a too much flow rate there. Okay. Then, let's take a look at what happens here. Oh, okay, no proteins, no proteins, no proteins, okay, in the solute, but there's seven. So that says with number D, something's wrong. There shouldn't be proteins there. Let's take a look at the second one. No glucose, no glucose, but in B and D, it is glucose, 0 0.1 grams per 100 cubic centimeters. Let's take a look at sodium. Uh, reasonably high, high sodium content, high sodium content. B and B, they're eating too much salt. They're not living a healthy lifestyle. There's too much salt inside that solute. C seems a very low one, so it's not eating as much salt. Ammonium ions, A is 0 0.04, and the rest is zero. Urea, okay, so he's producing a lot of urea. This looks like uh, uh, someone who might be going to the gym, and, because he, um, and also he might be taking creatinine and producing a lot of that urea as we break down the amino acids or proteins. Lower, lower, and uh, low, but not as uh, higher, but not as high as A. So let's take a look at the questions. State in which, uh, with a reason, which of the parts A, B, C, or D of the nephron represents the following? Afferent arteriole. Okay, so afferent arteriole. Okay, so oh, I'm, I'm understanding my question incorrectly here. 
So these are just different parts of, of the nephron. So if we draw the nephron, afferent arterial, glomerulus, afferent arterial, Bowman's capsule, there we go, and proximal tubule. Okay, so let's take a look. So which one will be the afferent arterial? So I'm still going to have in the afferent arterial, I'm still going to have um, I'm going to have a lot of sodium, not filtered yet, so there's going to be a lot of sodium. There's going to be a lot of proteins. There's going to be some glucose in there, uh, definitely glucose in there. Um, and then urea, we're going to have a high concentration of urea. And But the memo, let's take a look at what the memo says to us. Um, then. For A, they say B is the afferent arterial, contains proteins, as we said. Okay, so B is going to be afferent arterial. B is over here. Contains a lot of proteins still. Okay, then Bowman's capsule. Which one is the Bowman's capsule? According to the memo, they say B because it's got the highest concentration of glucose but no proteins. Okay, so uh glucose let's take a look glucose higher uh, and but it hasn't got any proteins so b is going to be over here in the bowman's capsule remember that glucose is going to be reabsorbed back into the into the blood later and no, it's fine. We almost finished, but I will post the the, the lesson. I will post it on Google Classroom as soon as I get a chance. Unfortunately, I couldn't yes, post, post our previous lesson. I lost our previous lesson. My my heart yeah, rate no, was. No, what about the lesson, sir? Yeah. Sorry. No stress. Um, guys, sorry that I didn't post our previous lesson yet. Uh, the one on um, we were supposed to have on I think uh, that we had on Thursday. I was supposed to uh, post it on Friday, but I lost my hard drive. My hard drive crashed. Uh, and so, yeah, I had to, um, I'll have to redo that lesson later. But this one, I will hopefully post it either tonight or tomorrow. Tip, will you have a question? Yes, sir. Um, so, do you use the same uh, classroom as, uh, I mean, the same, yeah, the, the same classroom as Miss Perry's one? Yes, I will post in that one, yes. The HP one. And so for seven point, okay, I'll come back, sir. I was, okay. I was, I wanted to, I wanted to ask regarding seven point three, sir. Okay, let's finish this one, then we can go back to that one. Okay, okay. Yes, then loop of Henry. Now remember, loop of Henry is going to be over there. Okay, it's going to, and then come back up before we go into the distal tubule. And they saying to us that is a C, a solid number C. There's no glucose. Glucose has been taken. Because glucose leaves here already. Glucose leaves here. And so C will be at the loop of Henry for the reason that there's no glucose left in there. The other reason they're giving to us is that it tells us that there's a lower concentration of sodium. Um, so some of the sodium is already absorbed. And then lastly, they want to know what, what's going to be in the collecting duct. Now, the collecting duct is right here at the very end. Let's just go. There's the collecting duct over there. And so, if we take a look, it's, it should have the highest concentration of urea inside it. And let's take a look. Yes, highest concentration of urea in the collecting duct because all of it will go out of the blood and into the, uh, and into the urine. You said you had a question on 7.2, correct? Okay, yes, 7.2. Let's take a look. Okay, 7.2 was with regards to the to the ADH question. And so what was that? your question? So for 7.3. 7.3, okay. I said because during a hot day, the heat makes okay. the body undergo transpiration in a form of sweat. This is done to cool this is this is done to cool down the body. And it causes the body to lose um, less water in the form of urea during a hot day. When I call it the opposite happens. That is perfect. But be careful, you used one wrong word here. You used respiration. Uh, you, you actually meant 
transpir uh, not yes. transpiration, uh, but the, the loss of water through evaporation from sweat. Okay. Okay. So, I, so is it the same if you wrote um, transpiration instead of evaporation? Uh, be careful. Transpiration is actually evaporation through plants, and you're not a plant. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. So that's the lesson. Um, I will post it. Um, is there anybody that has any questions? Um, yes, sir. Yes. Uh, so for 2.3.3, yes. is the answer because the efferent material is not bigger than the efferents in the diagram. So correct. it's not supposed to. That is correct. Oh. Because um, if, if you take a look at, at the two, let me just put it up here. If you take a look at the two, and you can see I've drawn it here. Um, uh, I've drawn here that this one needs to be much bigger, and that one needs to be a lot smaller, so that we have, uh, of course, a high blood pressure inside the glomerulus to push the filtrate into the Bowman's capsule. And so, yes, you quite on spot there. The afferent arterial or A needs to be bigger than the efferent arterial. They mustn't be the same size. But so I don't understand, how is something that's bigger have, have like will have more pressure than something that's smaller? Isn't like, isn't volume inversely proportional to pressure? Okay, let's take a look. Here's two boxes. Inside these boxes, I've got the same amount of molecules. These molecules move around and they hit the side of the container, right? Yes, sir. As they hit the side of the container, that's what we call pressure. One, two, three, four, five molecules. One, two, three, four, five molecules. Which one, which is, where is, it going to hit the size of the container more, the small container or the large container? Small one, sir. There we go. So that's more pressure. And so over here, you're going to have higher volume, high volume, uh, low pressure. Here you're going to have low volume, high pressure. Think about if you take a, a hose, a garden hose, right and in that garden hose there's a tap okay there's a tap and you're pouring water into this garden hose and you go and you stick your finger right there right what's going to happen to that water that's coming out there it's going to come out at a higher pressure yes sir okay and so the same happens over here low pressure high volume, high pressure, low volume. And so all the pressure dams up here and gets pushed out. Because, it, because the blood doesn't want to go there, it gets pushed out into the Bowen's cap. Yeah, well, so I thought that's the, the afferent arterial, um, it, it produces more pressure because the textbook says it's bigger but that doesn't make sense so no the afferent is it produces pressure because there's a size difference because this one is bigger <laughs> and this one is smaller the afferent is bigger than the efferent which is smaller and so where does the pressure happen over here um, another analogy that we can give for that is if we take a look at uh, a toll gate we have a, a highway and in sunny over here, we've got a toll gate. And then what happens over here is the pressure becomes high. Why? Because I am taking something that's this wide and I'm making something that is less wide. Okay, so we're, we're causing pressure in that, in that area. We're causing pressure. After that, it's wide again, then there's low pressure. But in this area, there's high pressure. And this is what happening it happens in that area now. There's high pressure there. Because it's All right, so. over and here.
4.3.1.1c. Mm. I mean, I mean B. So yes. I said that um, it's B because there's glucose, sodium ions, and urea in the filtrate. Are we supposed to say that, but no proteins? Okay. Uh, so um, no, proteins is 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 going to be. It's an important one in terms of that. But as long as you mention one of the two, I'm going to be happy because I'm only awarding one mark for that. Either because of high concentrations of glucose or if you said there's no protein steps. No, sir. Okay. Okay, any more questions, guys? Okay. Also, um, so 3.1.1c. Mm, 3.1.1, let me just find it quickly. Uh, 3.2.1. Okay. 3.1.1, sir. Okay, C, yes, okay. Yes, I've got it. Uh, so, all right, so, so what, what I said was, um, <clears throat> so I said that the sodium level is the lowest and this shows that tubular reabsorption of warts in the loop of Henle is occurring. It, do we have to say there's no glucose? as well. Okay, again, um, I'm looking at all three factors here. There's three things given here. Um, and it's only counting one mark. So I will award I will award one mark for either you saying the area concentration is higher, or I will give a mark for no glucose, or I will give a mark for lower concentration of sodium. So All right, sir. We will get to the mark, okay? All right, thank you, sir. Okay. Any more questions, guys? Oh, in, yeah, so when Tepo said um, transpiration, was it perspiration or evaporation? Yes. No, he was talking about, um, okay, I, I used the wrong word as well there. Um, so when he said, he said respiration, you're not allowed to use transpiration, that's three plants. Respiration that's um, that's happening at a cellular level, that's CO2 and H2O. Evaporation happens from the skin, but yes, perspiration. Before you get evaporation from the skin, you have to get perspiration, which is? Okay. So perspiration.